Hi again, everybody. And as I said earlier, I really hope that you appreciate the slate of content that we've put together for you. But, you know, when we were curating it, it dawned on us that it's it's awful heavy. There's a lot, you know, there's supply chain and there's staffing issues and, you know, the, the cybersecurity. It's a lot. So Sarah and Teresa and I, my colleagues here with me now, we thought about it. We thought, you know what, wouldn't it be great if we spent just a little bit of time and we're each going to do five bullet points about the great things about the promo industry, just to kind of hashtag positivity, hashtag positive vibes. Because look, we know over the past 19 months that people have been dealing with a lot in you know the world, but certainly this industry. You know, it's you know everybody's angst-ridden and kind of burnt out. So we are going to remind you very quickly, five bullet points each, um, what it is that makes this industry so special. So without further ado, Sarah's going to go first, and she's going to tell us five ways the industry has changed for the better since COVID. Sarah. Great. Thank you, Michelle. And as Nate and Michelle mentioned, we'll be sharing our lists of five things. So I'm going to start out first. I'm going to start with five ways the industry has changed for the better. So may sound a little strange, may sound a little jarring, but I think there's there's a good reason for this. First off, um, Companies are more flexible and resourceful than ever. So for those of us who've been in promo a long time, we know this is a very resourceful and creative industry. But that was really put to the test this year when things were getting canceled left and right, events were non-existent, sales were at zero. So companies have had to be very agile with weathering this storm um, and creative about how to go to market when things were were very um, uncertain and unsure. So we're not out of the woods yet, you know, with ongoing uncertainty, obviously supply chain concerns, we talked about that today. That's put a lot of pressure on promo, but it's really requiring companies to be more flexible and creative than ever. So for example, like kidding was a, was a kind of a value add nice to have early on before the pandemic. Now it's become a lifeline for a lot of businesses, especially because companies are still uh, maintaining remote workforces. So I've heard so many times like, oh, we had to set up card tables in our offices or, oh, I, I had this in my garage because really quickly we had to get up to speed with making sure we were getting packages, <clears throat> excuse me, to homes. Another is PPE. So companies tapped into their their uh, their network very quickly and started churning out PPE and getting that sourced and out to their clients that needed it quickly last year. Number two, management is much more aware of their financial situation. So the drastic fall in sales in the beginning of the pandemic, it's put a new emphasis on financial planning and having emergency funds for those inevitable rainy days. Obviously, COVID wasn't something we could plan for, you know, but it did show very quickly how things can change. And it compelled everyone to kind of experience the, the not so pleasant or sexy side of running a business. And so with that, owners are becoming more aware of the nitty gritty of their firms, how they're operating day to day, the hard numbers, the P&L statements, payroll. And they're realizing even when things are going well, it's really important to account for the unknown and regularly monitor expenses. Um, companies this year had to run leaner to weather the storm. They had to figure that out quickly. They became more fluent in government aid programs and what goes into a loan application. And it really behooves owners of any company to govern their firm well, especially when the time for important and difficult business decisions comes. And and so monitoring the company's financial status is the most essential part of being able to do that quickly and effectively. Number three, executives are more cognizant of sustainability. So COVID really showed us how interconnected everything is, how contingent things are. We're seeing that with the supply chain in particular. Um, we may not have been really aware of that before. So that's putting an emphasis on how a promo can be more sustainable. And actually tomorrow, I will have a session with Jake Krawlick on sustainability. But for now, I will say that companies are becoming more aware of their presence in society and how they can do more good for their people, their communities, and the environment. So um, the interconnectedness of everything has been really revealed to us this past year in a big way. So we'll talk tomorrow about how sustainability is not just eco-friendly. And that's really important. Like we have Top 40 supplier PCNA. They donate proceeds from sales of their eco-smart line to 1% for the planet, which donates to environmental nonprofits. And that's great. That's awesome. But there's really been a renewed emphasis on the other two pillars of sustainability, which are people and profit. And that's the common good of our communities and the good governance of a company itself. So for example, our um, top 40 supplier Gemline, they are our 2021 supplier of the year. They've been recognized as a sustainable business leader by the state of Massachusetts for their commitment to a host of sustainability issues. The environment is one of them, but also ethical business practices and diversity and inclusion efforts. Those are part of sustainability as well. 
Number four, teams are more customer service focused. Um, you know, I'd say that tongue in cheek because it's it's been a very difficult year for the for the industry and trying to serve customers where they are. It's a lot of uncertainty, but we've really seen how reliant suppliers and distributors are on each other and how much they count on each other to do business. And again, it's not been easy this year. The supply chain, the staff shortages have been huge challenges, but those are really true team players and partners have really shown how business can be done during a difficult time. I think kindness, honesty, transparency, transparency. There's so much appreciated now, even more, I think, than COVID. And so those strong relationships between suppliers and distributors and their end buyers in turn have really been put into focus and we're appreciating them anew. So we're, we're managing expectations. We're keeping customers aware of fluid situations. That's always been the case, how important that is, but it's never been more important than during COVID and never more appreciated. Um, I've heard from so many so many companies about how they, they end up spending hours and sleepless nights just being super creative with alternative solutions for their clients, sourcing product from multiple places. It's not always fun, but you know they, they realize that to keep promo humming along, they're going to have to spend these sleepless nights to do what they can to get their clients what they need, because that's going to build those long-term relationship, relationships that last beyond COVID and the pandemic. And number five, we're all more thankful for what we have. I know I am. I think there's a sense that we really can't take anything for granted. Uh, we were living our best lives in 2019. The industry was doing well. The economy was booming. That all changed overnight in March 2020. So it became very clear that we can't take what we have for granted, whatever that is. If it's our business, the people in our lives, experiences that we've had, we can't rest on our laurels assuming that you know, we'll keep reaping benefits forever. You know, we've all, I think, been conditioned now to be more appreciative of the little things and not tempted to assume that, oh, everything is just work out just because we'd like it to or we think it should. Um, everything we've assumed has been tested and challenged, but that makes us more persevering, more resilient, um, really striving for what we want and having these clear objectives and not putting things off. I can't tell you how many times I heard this year, you know, things are tough, but thankfully my family and I are healthy. Or, you know, as soon as I can, I'm taking that bucket list trip. Or the number of clients I work with is still down, but I'm grateful for the business I do have. And the way things have changed these past 20 months, I think, has certainly put things into perspective. And it slowed us down. It's made us more cognizant of appreciating what we once considered little things in life that I would say are actually the most important things. And with that, we'll go to Teresa. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to be talking about five things promo does better than other industries. So I guess kind of like bragging rights for everyone. Um, so number one. It's all about relationship building. Um, you know, in what other industry can your competitor become your best friend? So I know everyone always talks about how, you know, it's promotional products, but it's really about people, not the products. Um, you know, early on in the pandemic, we, you know, we heard so many stories of suppliers and distributors who were banding together, but that wasn't really an anomaly just from, you know, the, the, the pandemic. That's something that kind of is baked into the DNA of this industry. So. You know, live events, people look forward to seeing, you know, the people that they've worked with, you know, forever. So, like, unfortunately, you know, we're, we're not live right now, but if we were, everyone would be having a great time, you know, hanging out with each other. So that's one. Um, number two, uh, decorating any product in a myriad of ways to create coveted gifts, not giveaways. So, I mean, like, if you just think about, like, uh, concert t-shirts or any kind of t-shirts, people just have drawers full of t-shirts they got at a vacation or an event. Um, and these are, you know, they become more than just, you know, cotton or, you know, a blend or whatever. It, it becomes a memory for them. You know, drinkware, any of those kinds of things that that people kind of collect and hoard and, and really want. And, and we deliver those things for people. So the next one is thinking outside the box or inside the box when it comes to kidding. Um, you know, Sarah sort of mentioned how the industry embraced kidding over, you know, the last year. But it's, it's always impressive to me to see just like the clever things that people come up with. Like I would never, you know, I like to think of myself as a creative person, but, um, you know, what, what people in the industry come up with as far as like products or, or ways, ways to package them, it's, it always is impressive to me. And I love to see a great, you know, packaging, a great, um, you know, juxtaposition of, of items together. And, and that's always like a really interesting thing. Um, and so number four is offering an amazing ROI. So for example, a logo t-shirt generates 3,400 impressions throughout its lifetime. Um, and that of course is data straight from our data mandate. So <laughs> bringing that, that's from the ad impression study. Um, there's also, you know, the cost of per impression for a t-shirt is just two tenths, two tenths of a cent. So not even a cent, not even a penny. 
And then another interesting, you know, little factoid is that 40% of consumers keep promo products for at least 10 years. And I know for a fact, like my dad, you know, he loves free things so, 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 so much. He's probably had things for, you know, longer than a decade. Like he doesn't let things go. So, you know, definitely, you know, 10 years might even be, um, you know, on, on the low end for some people. Um, and now here, number five, this is the most important one. Happy hours. So basically, move over Mad Men, you know, drinks are on promo. I think I never had gone to as many like happy hours and, you know, parties and drinks since I started in promo. I mean, and I and I was in newspapers, so you would think we would know how to drink. But um, I, I really think that promo put puts us to shame. So those are my five. Um, and, you know, now we're going to move to Michelle, who has five leadership lessons. Thanks, Teresa. You know, over the past 19 months, I would say that I have spent a lot of time talking to owners of companies in the industry of all sizes. And the thing that has really struck me is, you know, there have been some missteps for sure, but, you know, it, that's fine. This is an, an unprecedented time. But the thing that really struck me is that this industry has risen to the occasion in, in a myriad of ways. And if I had to think of one word kind of from the outside looking in and talking to these people every day, all day, um, it's all inspiring. I, I think that you really saw the best of leadership in this industry. So I'm going to give five bullet points, um, some some that need a little work, but, you know, five great things that people can learn from that really came out of the pandemic. So, Sarah, if you could pull up the first one, which is get out of your office and spend time with your people. You know, I talked to a couple CEOs in the beginning of the pandemic, and I truly think that they were just so shell shocked. And, and who can blame them? But, you know, they just kind of hunkered down and looked at strategy and looked at numbers and they didn't pay attention to their people. They went weeks, if you can believe it, without talking to their people. And consequently, these, you know, their, their staffers who were feeling, you know, shell shocked on their own, they, were, they didn't feel communicated with and they didn't know what was going on. And that is a bad look for morale. So my advice would be just if you're working in, in the office or if you're virtual, Get out of your office and go and, and sit with people. Have lunch with a disparate group of people in your company. You can learn so much from them because I promise you, these people behind the scenes, you know, in the trenches, they are the ones with the secret sauce. They see where all the efficiencies can be kind of, you know, harvested and, you know, to make your company better and more competitive. And, you know, when you look at that, you know, you look at somebody like Richard Montanez from this morning, you know, here's the janitor who just because the CEO made the point to say, I want to hear from everybody, did they come up with, you know, flaming hot Cheetos? And I will share one example. Norman Cohn, who is our chairman at ASI, takes the time. Uh, we're all virtual now. So he talks to every new person who joins ASI, all of our interns, people who got a promotion and people who celebrate a special anniversary. He talks to them virtually. He has calls with them and asks a ton of questions, which is so smart because it's from talking to your people. Do you learn the best? So that's my tip number one. And Norman, by the way, is going to be doing a QA and a uh, at the end of day tomorrow with his daughter, Stephanie Schaefer, who's our vice president, our corporate vice president. So that's number one. Number two, lean into data, as Nate and John said, but don't discount the human part. So some of the companies who best handled the pandemic, it seems to me, and the tumultuousness of it were the ones who stayed in constant contact with their employees and their clients. An example I would give you would be Ohio-based uh, distributor Touchstone. Now, they grew their sales last year 49%. Only 1% of that was PPE. So how did they do it? They doubled down, looked at their data, and did deep dives into current clients and emerging markets and really mined those areas. And here's the tip I would give you. I think the days of a CEO sitting in an office in an executive suite with six other people making decisions, that's long over. You really need to get out and talk to people, analyze data, um, read what's going on in retail trends, and kind of you know, digest and metabolize that. So yes, look at the data, take Nate and John's advice, but also listen to the people side. You need the nuance and the context of the color of talking to people as well. Number three, embrace uncertainty and change. Real leaders know that the phrase, because we've always done it this way, is the death knell of innovation and growth. And an example I would give would be Joanne Lance, who's the CEO of Geiger, and she was the 2020 Counselor Person of the Year. Early on in the pandemic last year, Tim Andrews did a webinar and Joanne was one of the panelists on the webinar. And what she said really struck me. She said that 
as prepared as anyone could be for a global pandemic, they were ready to go because years before, Joanne had made her team, had asked her team to implement a disaster preparedness strategy. And what she was thinking at the time was, oh, if there's a natural disaster or we're the victims of a cyber attack, you know, she couldn't have obviously predicted COVID. But the fact of the matter is, is that they acted quick and they were nimble right out of the gate when COVID happened because Joanne didn't rest on her laurels. Her and her team do not live in the status quo. And because of that, they were very quick to react, which is, you know, again, a mark of a real leader. Number four, be authentic and transparent. This example I'm gonna give is about Craig Nadell. Craig Nadell and I have known each other for 26 years. And he is the CEO, of course, of Jack Nadell International. And he's one of the first people I met in the industry. And I know him so well that I know that he is medically incapable, medically incapable of gilding the lily. His filter is so thin, honestly, you could roll a joint out of it. I, I'm not even kidding you. So Craig has no filter mechanism. And what Craig did, again, in one of the first webinars that Tim Andrews did in the beginning of the pandemic, Craig said something I think that brought everyone to a dead halt. He said the following, this is gonna be bad and we're gonna have to make some really tough and really painful decisions, but save your business. Because if you don't save your business, you're not gonna be able to help your staffers, your clients, your family, anybody. So save the business first. And I remember it was shocking and it was jarring and it was sobering and it was very Craig because <laughs> Craig just, you know, it goes here and comes out there. But the fact that he had the wherewithal to say something that was, you know, maybe not the most popular thing to say or, you know, speaking the truth with such candor, again, the mark of a real leader. Lastly, and my favorite, decency, humor and kookiness can go a long way. So at ASI, every year at Thanksgiving, the Cohen family and Tim Andrews give out turkeys and pies to all of the staffers at ASI. And it's something that's been going on well before my time. And I've been there for almost 25 years. So, but people love it. Last year, because of COVID, you know, we weren't able to be all in person. So we had to do this kind of drive-by thing and they handed you a turkey and it was fine. But that sense of family wasn't there that we all have. You know, and I think at that point, if you look back to last November, you know, people were burnt out and they were feeling beaten down. And there was that constant news cycle of just bad news. So what did Tim Andrews do? He donned tights and feathers and trotted out like a turkey in front of a video just to make us all smile and laugh. And because of that, he was willing to put, you know, his ego and his dignity, let's not get ourselves, aside because he knew we all needed a good laugh. And why? Because, you know, the point of everything that I said and Sarah Sinatry said, we are all in this together. So thank you very much. Thank you, ladies. And we'll just leave that up there for one more second if we can. No? to just take in the glory of Tim dressed as a turkey. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed that very much. Again, thank you for staying with us.